Welcome to the Small Giants Fishbowl. This topic is how to deliver an extraordinary customer experience. Cultivating meaningful relationships with customers is part of being a small giant. However, what separates a small giant from others is their ability to embed customer service into their culture. Image One, a document lifecycle management company, has created a culture of customer service that has generated millions in revenue. In this fishbowl, you will learn from Image One co founder Joel Perlman on how to systematize and quantify customer service in your organization. Okay, here we go. The, um, just talking about the extraordinary customer experience, especially with the small giants community, um, very close to my heart. And I feel like it's a community that we all resonate with each other and, and think a lot alike. So it's very cool. Um, give you a quick before I get started. Our business, my business is uh, Image One, and we do um, uh, document lifecycle management. So there's three areas. We do manage print services, where we help people manage their internal copiers and printers. We do document workflow, and then the last piece is we help people with their document security. So I want to know before I kind of jump into this that I wanted to make sure you understand is that. This particular presentation that I'll be going through is actually a, um, a training course for our team. We have something we call, um, at Image One, we call it the IO University. Uh, and we have all different types of courses that our entire team goes through. This particular course, the Extraordinary Customer Experience, was actually done for the first time in May. So, um, again, super excited to talk about it. Uh, the customer experience is something that my partner and I uh, have been obsessed with since we were young. We actually um, call it a little bit of a curse because we can't go and have any experience without scrutinizing the customer experience that we've had. Um, but uh, in a lot of ways, I think that's been good for us. So um, let me go ahead and jump in. I'm going to share my screen for you here. Are we all set, Amsa? Okay, great. We're good. Awesome. So I'm going to start here uh, by, okay, giving you a little bit of background. So um, my partner and I, Rob Dubé, have been best friends since we were in fifth grade. Um, and our business history goes all the way back to high school where we actually sold blow pops um, together out of our lockers. We uh, had like 1,200% gross profit. We had free rent, we had no overhead, and I will tell you that we ate a lot of our inventory. Um, but uh, unfortunately, one day, our principal called us down to the office and he sat us down and said, hey guys, I appreciate what you're doing, but I have to shut you down because you're competing with the school store. So apparently public schooling and free enterprise don't mix well. While we were disappointed, um, it was actually an amazing experience for Rob and I because we fell in love with entrepreneurship and we really, really had a blast doing it. So it was great. Um, and we kept doing businesses all the way through college. We'd sold sweatshirts and t-shirts um, to high to dormitories and fraternities and sororities in college. And in college, we used to go to uh, Zingerman's Delicatessen in Ann Arbor, Michigan all the time. Um, and if you're not familiar with Zingerman's, it's an amazing deli. Um, interestingly enough, it was, it's uh, an original small giant written about in Bo's, uh, Bo Burlingham's book, Small Giants. And uh, Rob and I used to go there before the book was actually written. And the food was incredible. Um, I used to always get number 18, turkey coleslaw, Russian dressing, grilled on rye was my favorite. And Rob and I would, would, would sit there and while the food was amazing, we would talk about these lines that were out the door and around the corner and the energy that the team had when they would come out from behind their corner, the, the counters to take your orders and they had this friendly, helpful energy. They had caricatures and articles mostly about them on the walls. Um, and it was amazing and Rob and I just had this epiphany that these lines that were out the door weren't necessarily just, it, it wasn't just about the food. It was the combination of this amazing food, but it definitely was included this cus unbelievable customer experience that was driving these 
super long lines. Um, and it really inspired us and inspired us to say, you know what, whatever we do moving forward, whatever business we're in, we are going to build an extraordinary customer experience. Um, moving on into 1991 is when we started our business, uh, Image One. And after a few years in business, we made it, met a gentleman named Gino Wickman. Um, I, I would imagine that a decent amount of you maybe know him who brought the concept of the entrepreneurial operating system to us and we run our business on that. And one of the first things that Gino had us do is create and know our values and said, what are your values? Because you need to figure them out and you need to live them and breathe them in your, in your business every single day. And um, the one we're focused on today is passion for extraordinary and we've done that ever since. And then the last piece of our, our story really is small, the small giants community. And I think that Rob and I were unbelievably focused on an extraordinary customer experience for our clients. Um, what small giants I think has done for us is, is really reinforced the importance of also giving an extraordinary customer or, or an extraordinary experience to our team and our community. Um, so, let me start with the definition of extraordinary. Beyond what is usual, ordinary, regular, or established. So what we talk about with our team is that in every interaction or any situation where anybody touches us, whether it's a sales call or it's something they see like an invoice, we want to recognize whether what they're looking at or that what the, the, that particular interaction, is it ordinary or is it beyond ordinary? Because if it is ordinary, we want to we want to make it beyond ordinary and turn it into something extraordinary. And so assuming that this IO extraordinary customer experience is 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 the experience, the circle, what is at the core what is at the heart what's at the center of this customer experience and the answer is an amazing people and in our case it's the image one team so something again that we we, we learned uh, a while ago was that if we want to provide an extraordinary customer experience we have to deliver an extraordinary experience to our team first i think this is something that this group really knows well and so another concept that we get from Gino is this concept he calls it get it, want it, capacity to do it. And this pertains to the people that, that work for us. And so um, get it is the idea that the, that the individual actually has the values, right? In this case, passion, a passion for extraordinary. They want it, they're excited about the position they're going into, they're passionate about it, and capacity to do it means they actually have the skill set. So quick question for you, if you want to type it in the chat is, when, when interviewing, what do you think the most difficult of the three to find is? Any thoughts out there? Getting anything, Hamsa? Uh, not yet. All right, well, I'll jump in. The answer is get it. Um, so I, had, I pulled a number really out of my butt of 2.3% that I said to, the, to uh, my team um, that of people that got it, like I said, I made that number up. But when I checked in with um, HR, uh, they actually validated it's, it's, prob it's, it's pretty close to that number. Very few get it. And the reason that we bring this up and we bring it up to our team is we want them to understand that they're a small, in a very small group, and, and we, we believe it makes them special. So assuming that we're providing an extraordinary experience to our customers and also our team, what is the impact, right? And so there's two things that we really, I really wanted to get out of this presentation for our team, what I wanted them to walk away with. One, was the impact that the extraordinary experience is actually having on our company and, and in our lives. And I wanted them to, because they understand the impact, be inspired to take it to another level. 
And so starting with delivering an extraordinary experience for our team members, what's the impact of that? So an obvious answer is we're gonna have a happier team if we're providing them with an extraordinary experience. So what's the impact of them being happier now, right? And there's three things I'll talk about. One is that we can recruit the best. So we have an amazing young woman that works for us named Holly. She's in customer care. She, we hired her this year. And she's had this just amazing, personable uh, energy, perfect fit for us, brought that passion for extraordinary. And um, I asked her, I said, hey, Holly, just out of curiosity, where did you get our name? And she said, I got you from the, the national best and brightest uh, companies to work for list. And um, I just thought that was so powerful. Um, and, and what's cool is, and we're finding this more and more, that people are contacting us and telling us how much our culture is resonating with them. And uh, so it's been pretty cool. And so once we, re we recruit the best, now we have to retain them. We have to be able to keep them. And we ask to our, the question to our team, why does retention matter, right? And so we talk about that there's a very high cost of hiring. There's a high cost of onboarding. There's lost productivity. It may, may take a new person time to get up to speed. There's lost engagement. And lastly, there's a cultural impact. When people are leaving all the time, people take time to ask why and are trying to figure it out. And then the last piece um, is that a happier team is an engaged team. This is one poll that basically said there's 22% higher profitability, 21% higher productivity, and 37% lower absenteeism, right? So I think we, this group especially would all agree that when you have an engaged team, um, you are gonna do way better in these percentages for sure. So let's jump into a little bit to customer impact now. So you get customer loyalty. Right. When you're going to, if you deliver an extraordinary experience, you're going to have immense customer loyalty. So here's four of our bigger clients Mount Carmel Hospital, 13 years, Quicken Loans, 20 years, Marathon Oil, seven, and Nationwide Insurance, nine years. Now, speaking of Quicken Loans and loyalty, Quicken started with us in around 1992. They did around $40,000 a year in revenue with us that year. We have grown and evolved with them. And throughout, um, I think done a pretty good job of, of delivering them a really strong experience. One that I think today they would tell you that we're one of their favorite vendors. And again, in 1992, $40,000 in revenue. And in 2016, in 2016, they did $2 million in revenue with us. So some substantial growth, and that's what you get from this customer loyalty. There's another thing that we wanted to make sure that our team understood, and that is that there isn't only a company impact, but there's an individual impact. And so Mount Carmel Hospital is a hospital out of Columbus, Ohio, uh, had been our client for quite a few years. They're actually um, part of a conglomerate called Trinity Health Systems, who owns about 80, ho 80 health hospitals nationwide. Um, and they made a decision at a very high level, the corporate level, that they were going to uh, go with one vendor to handle all of their managed print services across the nation. They made that decision. Unfortunately, um, it was out of our hands, and they made the we were not the vendor chosen and we lost that business. Um, that was about a year and a half ago or so, um, maybe a little bit longer. And what happened was is the, the COO and the director of IT loved us so much and loved the customer experience we'd given to them. They fought their butts off to keep us. I mean, fought and fought and fought. Um, and we got an extra year and a half out of them. Ultimately, we ended up actually losing the contract completely. But while 79 of the hospital systems got turned right over, we were one, uh, we were the only vendor that actually got an extra year and a half. And so what we wanted to show to the team was the impact of that year. Um, so to pin it down to 2016, 
it was worth an additional $273,000 in net income. And then we're an open book business. We, we, we do the great game of business. So we do profit sharing with everybody in the company. And with Mount Carmel in 2016, everybody in the company got a $2,474 bonus. If they had not fought their butts for, uh, for us and we had lost them when everybody else did, the bonus would have been $1,136 per person or $1,338 less. So again, wanted to make sure they really understand it, understood the impact down to the team member uh, level. And then the last piece, which is really important, is the referral engine that it causes when, uh, when you have that strong customer experience, one that's not only they love, but it's also very memorable and they want to talk about you. So at Mount Carmel, I just talked about our original contact there was named Bob. And Bob had left after a few years, and Bob also loved the experience we were giving him at Mount Carmel Hospital. And he actually went over to Nationwide Insurance. And Bob, for about three years, tried to get us an opportunity in there. And he gave us a call one day and he said, hey guys, I think I got you an opportunity. And we got into one branch of Nationwide Insurance. And that one went great and we got the next one and we got the next one and we got the next one. And eventually through a bid with a lot of big companies, because of the experience we were giving them one corporate headquarters and that Mount Carmel, uh, that lead from Bob turned into $2.4 million with the additional revenue. Again, all because of the experience we had given him. A gentleman named uh, Eric from CompuWare moved over to Crane Communications and loved what we were doing there and added that added $170,000 a year in revenue. Michigan Cat, one of our clients, led us to one of their subsidiaries for $164,000 a year. And Quicken Loans led us over to Greektown Casino for $123,000 and Jack Entertainment for $217,000. So these four cl uh, clients gave us, led us to five other clients worth $3 million a year in revenue or 20% of our total revenue. And what I want you to know is this is honestly just a sampling. So we're, we're, I'm, I, I know that the amount is well over 50%. I can attribute to the customer experience that we're giving today. So pretty powerful. The last piece is that, you know, we work on this foundation of care in our organization. And so we created what we call the IO cycle of care. And it's the idea that if you kind of start with leadership at image one, that we genuinely care about and appreciate our team members. We care about their success. And we understand the personal impact that the customer actually has on our lives. And therefore, we genuinely care about and appreciate our customers and want them to be successful. And so going back to the team member, because they actually, like all good relationships, they feel the genuine care and the appreciation, they genuinely care about us and appreciate us and really want us to be successful. And at the same time, they genuinely, because they're part of this culture and they understand it, they genuinely care and appreciate for the customer as well. And so the customer ultimately, because they feel this genuine care and appreciation and starts start to really trust us, they genuinely care and appreciate us. And that's where it leads to all this re these referrals and the customer loyalty that we get over and over again. And now you have this cycle of all this care and appreciation going around and around and all this love and the way the image one believes, it goes out to the universe. And we kind of believe that it just kind of goes back and forth and back and forth. And from our perspective, we believe it's about something bigger than just the business. So I'd love to hear some, so if you guys have any thoughts on this, but I have a, my question for you is, why isn't a good experience good enough anymore? Getting anything, Emsa? Uh, Joanna said social media. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else said a good experience is what's expected now. Uh, everyone can give good, few can be great. You need to stand out. People expect good service. 
You need to stand out and beat expectations. Good isn't memorable. Everyone expect, expects more. Great. So those are awesome answers. I think the expectation one is huge. And it's because we live in a service on demand, instant gratification uh, culture now. And because of that, all the people who kind of talk about expectations, expectations have really gone through the roof. Right. I mean, we can think about that personally. Think about it with our kids and kind of this instant gratification that they need, the one and now um, that happens. You know, it's interesting. I'm um, I'm actually uh, rounding like you know 50 years old in about a year, and people and I always say, "Oh my God, I'm going to be 50," and people always say, "Oh, don't worry, 50 is the new 40," and I'm always like, "Well, tell my back and my bladder that," and so on and so forth. But um, but I, you know, I, I kind of feel like good is the new average, right? To stand out in our society, um, to, you know, to compete with this kind of instant service on demand society that we live in, um, we have to take it to another level. And honestly, I don't really think that there's a better example of service on demand um, than an Amazon. Um, I love this quote from Amazon. Amazon maintains an obsessive focus on removing every pain point from the buying process. And I was thinking about, and we have a tagline at Image One. It's easy, efficient, and reliable. And then I was thinking about Amazon. They are unbelievably easy to deal with. They're unbelievably efficient, and they're unbelievably reliable, right? And so, and they're not, and it's not sometimes, and I think this is a really important point, it's the consistency of them being easy, efficient, and reliable almost every time that you deal with them that makes them powerful and makes them great. It's really powerful. So if, if you're any organization, I mean, no one's going to pick a, a, a company, an organization that has a good deliverable sometimes, right? That sometimes they're, they're average, sometimes they're good, and sometimes they're great. You're never going to think they're extraordinary. You have to be consistently strong all the time, and that leads you to being extraordinary. So question for you, I'd love to hear your thoughts. What percentage of online sales in the U.S. did Amazon account for in 2016? Any thoughts? Dan, anything? 7%, 60 percent, 25 percent, 48%, 70%. <laughs> Forty-three percent. I mean, you guys know. I mean, the amount of online retail that is out there is unbelievable, and Amazon gets forty-three percent. Pretty powerful um, service on demand, crazy de consistency and delivery. That's what you get. I mean, all customer experience, if you can think about it, because they are a they sell commodity, right? And so this is probably my biggest mentor when it comes to customer experience, Tony Haysh of Zappos. Um, he decided many years ago, he was gonna take the old, one of the oldest commodities in the history of man, I think, um, selling shoes, right? Cavemen were wearing probably leaves on their feet. And he decided he was gonna take um, shoes, and by the way, not his own brand of shoes, but shoes that everybody else sells, in thousands of other stores across the United States. And by the way, I'm gonna do this exact same thing. I wanna sell the exact same thing as them. The only thing I'm gonna do different is I'm gonna give them a wow customer experience. And that's what he did. And he did three really powerful things. One, so simple though. He took his phone number and he put it blatantly on every page of the website. And so, the power of that is, I mean, we've all had this experience where you're online and you're looking for a phone number and they bury it. And there's a reason that they bury that phone number. The reason they bury it is because it costs money to have that phone number up there because you need people on the other side of that phone sitting there. And that's why they bury it. Well, what Tony said is, I don't care. I'm gonna put a lot of people on the other side of the phone. I'm going to train them to give a wow experience and I'm gonna have them available 24 seven. And that's exactly what he did. Super powerful, right? All investment in customer experience to sell shoes. 
He made a 365 day return policy. I can buy 10 pair of shoes today and return them in, in 364 days at no cost. And then he had ridiculous delivery, generally one to two days. So again, one of the most common commodities ever, all he did was make the customer experience incredible. And he sold to Amazon a few years ago for I think roughly a billion dollars. So pretty powerful. So again, back to the, the that now we talked a little bit about um, Amazon and Tony, their customer experience. Let me give you a sense of the, the IO's extraordinary customer experience. And we break it up into four quadrants. The first one is how we look. So again, and everything that, that, a, that a client, a prospect, anybody sees, right? This is how we want them to, to see us. We want them to see us as approachable, clear and simple, fresh and clean and organized. Whether it's our office, whether it's our vehicle or a business card, this is how we want them to see us all the time. The second piece is how we sound, right? And that's whether it's us just talking to them verbally in a sales call, whether it's a voicemail, whether it's an on hold message. We want to sound friendly, positive, real and genuine is a real big one for us. And then we, sometimes we just need to shut up, actually. We need to be great listeners, probably most of the time. The other thing I want to point out that is that in there's there's voice and sound in in uh, in the written word. So if you do a ton of emailing or people get, you know, whatever they happen to get for you, an invoice, whatever it is, there's a sound there too. So this is an example of a supplies um, uh, tracking um, sheet. And if you look at the first line or the second line, it says, thank you for your order. The following items have been shipped on sales order 108359. So again, pretty ordinary. There's nothing special about this, nothing stand out, right? So I'll give you a little example of what it might look like from image one. So a couple lines I'll point out. Hey there, thanks for ordering. Are you more of a details person? We get it. Happy printing your friends at image one. Again, is it is it ordinary? It's hopefully a little bit beyond ordinary. So then we jump into how we deliver. We use a formula at image one, it's E squared plus R plus X equals extraordinary. And that is easy plus efficient plus reliable plus extra equals extraordinary. So we have been at image one, our tagline has been easy, efficient, reliable. And I think we've been doing it pretty consistently. And I think that's why we're getting some good uh, feedback from our clients. The piece that we added in this year is the plus extra. And that's kind of what I talked about at the beginning, right? If you break up whole extraordinary into two, you have extra and you have ordinary. And so the idea around it, again, is to look for anything that's ordinary, anything that touches the client, and how do we add a, an extra in every interaction, every single one, whether it's verbal or written, anything from a sales call to an invoice. We want it to not be ordinary, but to add the extra and make it extraordinary. So one of the things that we did was uh, we did an exercise with our group. We broke them up into, uh, we broke them up into little groups, teams, and we had them do a solve for X. And again, at image one, we're calling the X, the extra. So um, we did a solve for X. We asked them to brainstorm ideas for the X. And then we also had them come up with at least one no cost idea. And because I wanna be clear that these ideas for the X do not have to be big. They actually can be really small and simple, and sometimes they don't have to cost anything. A lot of the time, they don't have to cost a lot at all, if anything. It could be just in your language or something you're writing on, uh, on, a, on a document like I had just shown you earlier. And so what I'll tell you is we got some amazing, amazing feedback uh, from our team. Honestly, the creativity that came, came out of our team when we empowered them to do this was unbelievable. We got amazing suggestions, ones that we're actually using today. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I implore you to kind of go to your team and ask them to be creative and think out of the box. And, and that's not the issue. The creativity is actually the easy part of doing this. Really, the, the, the more difficult part is the commitment to it. And it's kind of producing that consistency of the always, always delivering extraordinary, always adding the X. And that just takes constant communication and constant training. So, but from a creativity standpoint, the, um, I'll give you a couple examples. One is we had, um, at our company meetings, we always have someone stand up and give something that they did out of the box, some passion for extraordinary things that they did for a client. And um, one of our team members, Brandon, he was telling us he was at a client and uh, he could tell that the um, he looked underneath the, he fixed the printer and he could see that the cords were all messed up, the computer cords and the printer cords. So all he did was he took a little, uh, some bands and he cleaned them up real nice and he banded them all up and the customer was super grateful that he did that. And so what came out of that um, was an X idea that why aren't we doing that every time? If we're out there and we see that there's a mess, the cords are a mess, Let's create our own little bands and on them, we'll, we'll tie them up and it'll say image one, experience extraordinary on it. So, so that's one sample. Also, to just talking about language for a second, um, Dan uh, came up with the idea that he's basically, after every, this is a, a, our lead tech, um, that our whole team, after every uh, service job on a printer, they are going to, um say while i'm here or you know they'll, they'll say hey jim we're all set with your printer while i'm here what else can i do for you and i don't know if you can kind of tell the difference between i know you sometimes talk to companies and they'll say is there anything else i can do for you i don't know if you see the nuance and the difference while i'm here what else can i do for you but it's a little more servant language and then again the power comes in the consistency of jim hears that line from us every single time he, he, we get in front of him, he's gonna start to think, wow, these guys are great. I really believe that. The last thing, one last example, again, all really, really small costs is our stories around blow pops. And one of the things that we're gonna start doing is putting a blow pop on every printer or copier with a little uh, snippet of our story um, every time a service job is done. So again, simplicity but it takes you from ordinary to extraordinary it makes you stand out it makes you memorable and you're doing good things for the client one thing that um uh, i'll here's a tool that i think that you could use one of the things that we've started doing is making a list of all those touches and interactions that i'm talking about that you have with your customers or your prospects and we're writing those down and then we're kind of saying hey is it an ordinary interaction or is it extraordinary? And we're kind of checking the ordinary or extraordinary box. For this quarter, what we did is said, well, we can't do it all at once. Um, so we took areas that we had the highest interactions in. And so we focus on customer care, technicians, and uh, technical support, and then our discovery meetings, which is our first meeting with the prospect. So again, um, We've done that and it's, uh, we've come back with some amazing creative things that we send them out to the teams to actually do that. Um, the head of customer care, um, lead technician, they kind of were responsible for getting with their teams and figuring out what we're gonna add um, to our experience. So pretty powerful. The other piece of this is, and this is what I kind of keep talking about, training, consistency, um, you need to have some tools, and one of them is to create some process around. So this would be any interaction we have with a human being. Um, and it's the image one's process for delivering an extraordinary customer experience. And the first thing for us is to always be present and friendly. The second one is do what you say you're going to do. Interestingly enough, this do what you say you're going to do came from a small giants event. It used to be called a, a passport. It's now called a journey that I went on a few years ago. Um, we were at a manufacturing company and we were talking all about their culture and their customer experience. 
and there was two uh, two owners there, two partners, and one of them kind of, I guess, my age, a little younger, charismatic guy, and I was hanging on his word, every word, and there was an older gentleman there who was probably the founder, was probably close to, in mid-70s, maybe close to 80, and I remember thinking, oh, he's probably a little old school, and I'm so I'm kind of captivated by this younger gentleman, and he brings up, we, we start talking about customer experience. And again, the older gentleman hadn't said much, but all of a sudden he made a comment and he said, he said, you know, I think all you have to do is do what you say you're going to do. And you're ahead of almost every other company. And I will tell you that I, I probably discounted him a little bit, but interestingly enough, that simple comment was the most powerful and impactful thing that I took out of that entire experience the whole time. And I brought it back. And as you can see, I put it into our process because I think it's powerful. Do what you say you're gonna do. We all have this experience where people make promises and how often do companies come through? It's actually not as um, common as we would like. Communicate to the third. All it means is communicate, 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 or over-communicate. It's powerful, especially when things aren't going perfectly. People just want to know that you're considering them. They just want to know what's going on. If you let them know where you're at, it'll keep them happy. And the last piece is always deliver the extra, right? Deliver the extra. So I'm not going to go through these all, but what I all I want, I'm not going to go through some of the other processes that we came up with. We had a process for a complaint process, so on and so forth. But I would recommend that if you don't have processes for these to build them into your organization and your customer experience. So the last piece is how we create loyalty. American Express, I love this quote, if you can help your customers succeed with their customers, you're gonna make yourself indispensable as a service provider. I think that is so true. So we created an acronym called FAB. And the first one is focus on our customers' goals, right? So one of the things that we always talk about is we are not there to help them print better or improve process or to secure their documents. We are there to help them sell more mortgages, sell more insurance policies. If it's IT, if their goal, is for them is to keep their end users up and running and happy. That's our goal. So we need to be speaking their language and always talking their that language in, in, in a way that we're, we're focused on what is important to them, not to us. The second thing, and I really think this kind of goes to this service on demand society and culture we live in, is you need to anticipate customer needs. It's really powerful. We have to stay ahead of them. We have to be looking at data, giving them data, giving them ideas, keeping our eyes out constantly. And then the last piece, and I don't think there's still anything in life that's more important than this, life and or business, is building genuine relationships. And you do that through trust. Coming back to the IO cycle of care, if you genuinely care about your clients, you understand how they impact your life personally, you can build those genuine relationships, they'll feel it. At Image One, we have a lot of people that we have to build those relationships with, all the end users that we help, the IT director, the CIO sometimes, sometimes the CFO, sometimes the purchaser. And at the end of the day, what we want to create that level of loyalty and stickiness is that we have good, strong relationships with all those people, all those layers, and that they believe that we're delivering them an extraordinary experience. So full circle, that really is the, the IO, extraordinary customer experience, how we look, how we sound, how we deliver, how we create loyalty. And then, you know, once we have this, I think it's really important to keep a pulse on how we're doing. And so last year, um, we're about to do it. We're going to do another one in the fourth quarter of this year, but we did a survey last year. It's actually become a powerful tool. I'll kind of go through a few of the questions that we asked. But one of the questions we asked is, what was your customer experience with your previous provider? So we had 4% great, 20% good, 28% average, 
core was 11%, and then 37% said not applicable because they couldn't figure, they, they'd been with us so long they couldn't remember. And then if you could see at the bottom right of that, that left circle, there's an extraordinary with zero. If you go over to the right, we said, okay, what's your experience with us? And we had 60% said extraordinary to zero with previous, 37% great to 4% great, and 3% good to 20% good. So really powerful. And when we were looking at this, you know, I think we all try to do this as, as when we're selling to new prospects is talk about our service. And all companies, whether you're horrible at service or you're great at it, all companies say that their service is great, right? They try to win it over. So the question is when you truly are great and you truly have an extraordinary experience, what can you do to actually get them to actually believe you or get some credibility beforehand? So it's not perfect until they actually experience your service. They won't have 100% belief, but this has helped us a little bit. We've used this as a tool um, and started showing it to our prospects. Um, we showed them this, we asked another question, and I thought this was pretty powerful. And we let them choose all the reasons, reasons why companies work with Image One. And if you look at the top three, 97, 95, and 95%, they were all customer experience related reasons, responsive to our needs, friendly team, and easy to work with. Saving time and money when, was, was on the lower scale of those three. I thought that was pretty powerful. And then the last one is, would you recommend Image One to a business colleague? So 62% said, absolutely, I enthusiastically recommend Image One when I can. 37% said yes, and 1% said maybe. Uh, we had, um, we also asked the question, and again, we had about, uh, we did this to our top 100 account, accounts. We had about 80 uh, responses or so. Out of that, those 80 responses, 58 of those surveyed responses said they'd be willing to take a phone call from a potential client. I thought that was actually pretty uh, powerful and big. And again, one of the things that we actually do is we have all those names list, listed out on a sheet. And when we're in front of a prospect, we, when we talk about getting testimonials and credibility, we say, hey, if you wanna get a referral, just let us know, here's a list of 58 people that would agreed to take a phone call. Just let us know who you'd like to contact and we just wanna give them a heads up that you might be calling. So again, you can use this information as a tool. So honestly, that's really all I have today. I, um, as I went through this and I built this, uh, I worked on this presentation for the team. I, it really had a, an impact on me. I, I, what I wanted for my team was it to them to understand the impact. What it did for me is it took me to a whole new level of the impact that the experience is having on our business. And it, what, it, what I was looking for for my team, it did for me, which was really inspired us, me uh, to figure out how to help take this thing to a whole new level, one that can make us more memorable, have people talk about us. Um, and uh, hopefully you guys got a couple nuggets out of this and maybe been inspired to do some of these things for yourself. So I'm, uh, that's really all I have today. Um, is the idea of really looking for anything that's ordinary and making it extraordinary. Uh, if you have any questions, I would uh, love to take them. Uh, we have a question for you here, Joel. So have you sent a survey or asked for feedback from lost customers? And if so, how did you go about doing that? That is a great idea. Um, we, you know, honestly, we actually have a number that we use, which is um, a critical number as we go for 100% retention. Um, I think, um, don't quote me on this, but I think we lost one client last year and it was the big one, Mount Carmel Hospital. Um, and that they still love us. In fact, I met with the owner, the, uh, not the owner, the C, uh, the director of IT recently, and he said he's hoping one day he can kind of get us back in there. So I guess the answer is, um, I'm not sure that we do have that. I think it's a great idea. So uh, if we're not doing it, I certainly, I think we generally have a good pulse on why we lost them. 
I, I, I do. So that's the answer. But if we don't, I think it's a good thing to do. It's a great idea. Great. Uh, a couple of people have asked about the presentation. We just want to let you know that we will be sharing the presentation a little bit later today. Uh, the next question for you, Joel, is how can, can you tell us how you make or keep your employees happy? Oh, wow. Uh, how do we keep them happy? I mean, I think that the, I think the biggest thing comes back to that IO cycle of care, to be honest with you, it comes down to genuine care. Um, there's a lot of, I think, little things that we do day to day, but um, I think through the, just caring about them, I think through actually even the great game of business, having them actually involved, teaching them about financials, how to read an income statement and a balance sheet, having them all involved and participate in the success of the organization, um, it, 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 it really makes them take ownership. I mean, I think they feel ownership in the organization when you know that the success, that they kind of take part in the success. Now, if we don't do well, they also, we're all in it together. Um, but I think that's one big piece. Um, I think that we're just, a, we, do, we do things called surprise and delight where we just, you know, we'll, we'll send out things to uh, team members who might be struggling um, or, you know, maybe someone had a baby. We make sure we acknowledge that. Uh, we do community days here where everybody in the company, we encourage to go out and do a community, community day. Um, and we give that day off during the day. We give birthdays off. Um, so I can certainly come up with a whole list, but we try to do a lot of a lot of different things. I'd love to hear from you guys and some of the things that you're doing to make your uh, um, teams happy. Great, thank you for that. Um, the next one is: When do you conduct your client surveys annually or by milestones? Yeah, um, quite honestly, I haven't been great at having a rhythm on this, but we we talked about it, and we definitely need to do. I believe we need to do one um, at the end of every year. Uh, at the end of every year, um, we also have an ongoing. Um, we have some ongoing surveys that we use uh, to kind of get an instant pulse after we do a service job to make sure that we're doing performing the way that uh, we need to be. So it's a critical number that we look at on a, um, on a weekly basis, actually. But as far as a big pulse, pulse around how we're doing overall and making sure we're the contacts, it's once a year. Great. Uh, what is more important, company success or employee satisfaction, or can they even be separated? Um, I mean, I definitely think it's difficult to separate them. I think that I, from our perspective, I think that if you don't have a satisfied in, uh, team, team, you most likely are not going to be successful or at least nearly as successful as you can be. So um, our focus definitely is on, you know, we talk here about, and we got this uh, from Small Giants and Bo is that, you know, caring about the, the, the team member and the totality of their life. We talk about life balance, not work-life balance, as if when you're at work, um, you're, it's, you're not, you know, it's not part of life. And so we really focus on that, and I think it's, I think it's had a huge impact and will continue to have a huge back, impact on the success of the company. Great. Um, will anyone else have any questions? We are done with questions for the chat feature. Oops, maybe there's one more here. Um, uh, so, Joel, you mentioned blow pops on the printers and untangling cables. Can you share more extras? Oh, wow, putting me on the spot. <laughs> we had, um, uh, you know, someone came through yesterday in customer care on the concept of literally sending like a, almost like a pass it on card. So that the fact that, you know, while we take care of your printers and your copiers, we also care about the people around them and that we want to send you a thank you and gratitude. And if you want to go ahead and pass that gratitude on to someone today, that would be great. I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit, but that was, uh, that was one extra idea. The story around blow pops, um, the sales team got really excited and we haven't been doing this. And I know that a lot of you, especially small giants have great stories out there. But we haven't really been telling our story really well. And, and I think people a lot of times gravitate to it. So 
Um, there's, you know, in our discovery meetings, we are we want to stand out and be not not ordinary. And we're going to all of our team members are now going to tell the blow pop story and also talk a little bit about the um, the, the IO cycle of care, uh, which I think is is definitely going to be unique for companies to go in there and talk about care and appreciation um, and that we actually have a model for it. So there's a couple of examples right there. Great. Um, and then one more question on, uh, can you share any tips on how to make your employees feel more appreciated? Oh, how to make them feel more appreciated. I mean, I think appreciation still goes mostly to making sure that they, uh, they're feeling heard. Um, we, um, we certainly acknowledge them quite often when they're, you know, when they do good things. Um, we, something that we do with the, the, uh, led by my partner has been, you know, we do, uh, vision and goals, um, with all of our team members. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, it's been really powerful. They write down their personal goals and we help them go through those and try to help them accomplish them. I'm not sure that's answering the appreciation piece. Um, and I don't know that I'm answering it really well right now, but I think we do it in a lot of ways. And that, I'm, I'm, yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, how do you stay ahead of extraordinary with repeat clients? You have now defined their new expectation. What keeps extraordinary from becoming their ordinary? Well, I, I, I think that's a great question. I actually think it will become their ordinary. So I think that we have to stay on top of it. I think that we were just talking about this yesterday in a meeting. Um, we were talking about the, the acts and that it's bigger and how are we going to maintain all of these things that we're going to do. And it's going to take a whole nother level of training and communication on a consistent basis. So um, I do think it's going to become their ordinary. I think we're going to raise the expectations. And then I think we have to keep staying out of the box um, and coming up with new things to make sure that they don't fail and it doesn't become, um, you know, we have to, we're gonna have to change it up. So it's a, it's, it's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up. It's something we're really thinking about. Uh, and how do you demonstrate your culture to your team so that it's not as a do as I say, not as I do situation? Um, I mean, I think it's it's the way we communicate. I think it's the way that we come together as a team. Um, we have, you know, um, we do company meetings where we're, we're uh, we constantly um, are communicating to our team. We're constantly getting input on whatever we do. We're sending out surveys to ask for feedback. Um, we have a process in our strategies and our in our. Um, that we do an all-inclusive planning where we get feedback on the most important things to do in our organization. So it's not that the leaders, the, you know, that the executive team is making all the decisions to really, I think, goes down, uh, to, it goes to all levels of the organization um, where we're, you know, uh, getting them involved. And, and, and so I, I really think we just have a, a, a culture of empowerment here. And so I, I just, I don't think people feel that way at all. Great. And how long did it take you to find your core values and how many did you end up with? Yes, we have four core values um, and, you know, they've evolved over the years. Uh, the, that meeting, by the way, that we came up with them originally was many years ago. Uh, and so it was probably a couple hour debate, maybe knowing my partner and I might have been a three hour debate. So <laughs> fun process, though. Definitely a fun process. Okay, well, that's it for this one. Check out more fishbowls exclusively for the Small Giants community at smallgiants.org.